Do I want to die? Of course not. But I have to prove on paper that I do not like being in prison. Can you imagine? I'm not the only one. This story is in your hands. You are a part of this story. What's mine is yours. The I is you. Ask yourself, where am I from? Am I a foreigner? Whole, half, quarter, it doesn't really matter. It's 6 a.m. and there are a few loud and long bangs on our front door. Mum opens the door to eight officers rushing in, each occupying a room in the house from top to bottom and left to right. They tell us to be quick and pack only one bag. I'm in shock, thinking whether I had committed a crime the day before. We pack in five minutes and we are dragged out of the house and put in a caged van. The van has a funny smell, as if dogs had been there prior to us. We are taken to the police station and from there to the famous B-class prison in the middle of nowhere, Yarlswood Detention Centre. Our pictures are taken and we are given a card which will grant us an allowance of 75p a day. But there are no shops inside. There's only a storage room with mainly Doritos and Snickers, and I guess that's good enough. We are taken through eight metal doors, each one locked after the other. I see the worry on my mum's face. We reach our room, the windows are tinted, and they only open a few inches. The windows are tinted because, so that no one can see from the outside. But there are no people outside. There's a small courtyard, but the walls are too high and the barbed wires do not comfort me at all. The next day, roll calls begin. We are to be counted three times a day. The guards do not like seeing us out of our rooms after 9 p.m. They tell us to go back into our rooms. Now, they say there's a school in there, so I go to see how it is. I find myself dipping cut potatoes into color and then stamping the blank paper. I think, really, I'm 13 years old. So I leave. A month has passed now, and because of undesirable food and lack of vitamins and nearly no appetite, I start having pains. I cry, and the guards take me to a room which is called the health center. The doctor comes out, and he yells at me. He says, shut up. Where do you think you are? I don't reply because I have no energy. Then the nurse takes me in, but she grins at me. So I ask her if she had to go to university to get this degree only to work here. She gives me painkillers, calls me rude, and sends me back. It's two months now, and I hear my mum talk to the lawyer on the phone. She says, but we've lived here for six years, and now they want to deport us? We left once, we cannot go back. That's when my first miracle happens, and a woman is brought in by an accident. 
She stays for two days, and before leaving, she gives me a number to call. It's a number to start a campaign. So I do it, and it's called Stop Maltem's Deportation. It attracts media's attention, and they want to know more. But the Home Office, they don't like where this is going. Meanwhile, Mom is constantly applying for bail and is rejected. But the fifth time, the judge says to her, you cannot prove that Meltem doesn't like being in here. I cannot prove that I don't like being in prison as a 13-year-old. So I have to prove. Can I speak to the judge? No. Will he or she listen to me? No. So I go into the office and I ask for a razor. I go to my room, I lock my door, and I sit on the floor. Now, do I want to die? Of course not, but I have to prove. I take the razor and I slowly start to cut my wrists. Can you imagine? As a 13-year-old, I'm pushed to prove by cutting my wrists. I am taken to the hospital and the guard says, well, at least you have a day out. The same guard comes into the doctor's office with me and the doctor asks her, why are you doing this? She turns bright red, unable to answer. I'm taken back into prison and I find a marker pen. I go into my room again and I start to graffiti on the walls. Every inch of the wall, I graffiti on it. As I'm working on my art, roll calls are happening, and the guard who opens the door is furious at what she sees. She says, do you think this is your home? And I say then, what am I doing here? Later on, because of the suicide attempt, a male guard is placed in front of my room. The door is fully open, and he sits on his chair, staring at me. This guy will stare at me for 24 hours. I feel tense. I drop my nose piercing, and I kneel down to pick it. He says, do you have piercings anywhere else? I see his intentions, and it's too uncomfortable, so I ignore him. And now I can't even take a shower. It's the 15th of November, 2007, and we have a flight booked. Now, this is where the fun begins. It's 3 a.m., and we are strictly searched and put in a van. On the way to the airport, the manager of the immigration team says, if you shout, if you resist, I will tie your hands, your mouth, and your legs, and nobody would know you're there. Now tell this to your mum, but I don't tell her. I don't want her to know at all. He warns me five times. We are taken through the back of Heathrow Airport, where normal pas passengers don't enter. They take my mum out of the car first. 
And because she steps back a little, they push her onto the ground and handcuff her. It's my turn. They take me out. They kick and punch my arms and legs until they can take me up the stairs and seat me down. Two officers on each side, both clinging onto my arms and legs. I'm unable to move. I look the opposite way and I see my mum. She has a towel over her handcuffs and underneath that towel, this manager is squeezing the handcuffs so she would be in pain and be left powerless. By now, the plane is moving, but I don't want to go. So with the last bit of strength I have, I stand up and I tell the passengers what's going on. I tell them every single thing. The pilot comes out, he's angry. He yells, my, he yells at my mum, and then he looks at me. He tells the crew to offload us from the plane. Now, the immigration officers are angry. They c continue with their sarcasm until the prison, but we don't care. Again, we are taken back into prison, and we want to put in a complaint about the vile treatment we received. But nothing is done until a voluntary psychologist insists that we'd be taken to a hospital. We're in the children's ward with eight officers around us. It's 5 a.m. and I have the bed sheets over my head. They think I'm sleeping, so they have a small meeting, and I hear them say, okay, so if they resist again, just inject them. I panic, but I cannot do anything about it. The next morning, our lawyer calls the hospital, and we find out that the Home Office has hired a private jet for £25,000, just for me and my mum. I think, great, the helicopter was missing in the beginning, but now we have a private jet. And that's when my second miracle happens. And the Children's Commissioner, Sir Alainsley Green, walks in. A very compassionate old man. He asks a few questions and then he leaves. Surprisingly, the next day, we have our freedom. I later find out that this compassionate old man used to be a children's doctor for 30 years and has strong political influence. Now, asylum seekers are people who have fled war and conflicts, torture and rape. They are called refugees only after their claims are accepted and they are given um, leave to remain in the UK. It's illegal for asylum seekers to work, so they have to rely on benefits of £30 per person per week. They have to sign at their local police station every week or month to show that they have not absconded. There are 13 detention centers in the UK that imprisons asylum seekers indefinitely at any point in their claim. It can be a year into their claim or even 15 years into their claim. In 2014, the Home Office signed a new contract with Serco for £70 million to run Yarswood Detention Center. A year of detention in Colnbrook costs the taxpayer, that's you guys, £70,000. This is where your money is going to. Although Yarswood Detention Centre is an all-female prison, the majority of the guards in there are male. 
You are my story. Because in one way or another, we are all refugees. At one point in time, our parents, grandparents, ancestors, they made the journey for a better life. We are the change the older generation envisioned. And now we must go in the direction of positive change, where hopeful people are not locked up in prisons with your money, where all children are given the opportunity to do something great, and where we all, and when I say all, I mean everyone, have faith and compassion in the lives of others. Thank you.